Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast on a snowy Tuesday morning in State College. I am Tyler Donahue. He is Sean Fitz, and we got a lot to go through here on the latest episode. And we will have Brandon Short on in just a little while. We had him on much earlier in the year. A, a member of the Board of Trustees here at Penn State, also a former All-American linebacker with the Nittany Lions. So a ton of perspective whenever he drops on the podcast. And we gonna go, we're going to go down the rabbit hole a little bit with this contract for James Franklin. I know there's a lot of questions on the message board, on social media, from Sean and I ourselves last week about how this got done, why it got done, and what comes next for Penn State. He's going to help us with those conversations and also have some perspective on what looks like an upcoming defensive coordinator search for Penn State. The coaching carousel, if you hadn't noticed, is uh, on full speed and then some across college football. It will not impact the head coaching position at Penn State. 10-year contract, taking care of that with James Franklin. But Brent Pry, Sean, 11 consecutive seasons on James Franklin's staff. Looks like that streak is about to end. Yeah, happy for Brent Pry. He's being reported as the next head coach at Virginia Tech. This is a situation where he's been a coordinator for a long, long time. He's passed up a bunch of offers before, lower-level offers, and, and finally the right job came open. Uh, Virginia Tech's going to be interesting because uh, I don't think that, that fan base is particularly pleased with the hire. I, I think – of the world of Brent Pry, great guy, great coach, um, really uh, adaptive to schemes. And he's also a Bud Foster guy, which really should endear him to the Virginia Tech faithful. Um, but I'm not sure they're going to be happy about that based on, you know, how things ended with Fuente and, you know, going the coordinator route, not going a sexy higher route. And, you know, there's there's reports that they were in it for Billy Napier, but it really doesn't matter now because he's at Florida. Um, but yeah, Penn State's going to have an open coordinator position to fill. Um, you know, I think uh, it's going to be interesting to see um, if he takes any uh, assistant coaches with him because this is a situation. This is not like James Franklin coming from Vanderbilt to Penn State with a staff in place. Brent, Brent Price got a build out of staff. Now, conceivably, he's already got a bunch of names in mind, but we will see if that includes um, – Penn State guys, former Penn State guys that he's worked with here. Uh, we know Ryan Smith is on the staff there at cornerbacks coach. He would be, and I think, uh, you know, this is probably not the nicest way to say it. he'd be a fool not to keep Ryan Smith because he's got half of their their class committed down there at Virginia Tech. Um, but it's going to be interesting because John Scott Jr. has always been tied closely to Brent Pry. That's kind of the reason uh, Penn State brought him on staff. And uh, he, uh, J.C. Price is down there being the interim uh, and the defensive line coach at Virginia Tech. So Pry's going to have some decisions to make. It's not unlike when uh, James Franklin brought Sean Spencer and and kind of pushed Larry Johnson out because there's uh, there's risk reward with a decision like this. So I'll be very intrigued to see if that happens with uh, with John Scott or if any of these other guys that have been with Brent Pry for a long time. Um, boil over. It, it's going to be it's going to be an interesting couple of uh, of days. And when you spend this long with a head coach as, as an assistant coach, clearly you get to this point. Uh, Franklin, I'm sure when we hear from him on this, is going to be thrilled for for his friend getting this opportunity. Um, but this is a guy that Franklin has often referred to as being part of that inner circle, and and he keeps a pretty tight inner circle. Um, so the right opportunity, the power five opportunity, that hasn't been the case in the past with Brent Pry and some of these coaching possibilities. Um, but year number eight, James Franklin just got this contract losing Brent Pry. We talked about the big offensive coordinators the last couple of years. Quite the decision now awaits James Franklin as he tries to lay the foundation for whatever he wants to accomplish here with this new contract. Yeah. And, and he always says, you know, your coordinator should leave for power five jobs. And, you know, he lost more head, obviously. Um, and now Brent Pride of Virginia Tech. So things, you know, conceivably going in the right direction there. So, I mean, this is this is one you take if you're Penn State. You got to tip your hat to Brent Pry and say good luck. Um, not obviously not uh, after the, the season that he had as, as a defensive coordinator. Not not it's never the greatest time to lose a, a really good coach. But you'll have this and it's kind of I don't want to say expected, but it's it's kind of at the point where, you know, if it was going to happen, it was probably going to happen this offseason. So now Penn State's got some shuffling to do. Um, interesting collection of, of coaches on the defensive side of the ball. You don't have a, a true linebackers coach. Joe Lorig is a special teams coordinator and, and his coach, the outside linebackers. Of course, John Scott, we mentioned, is a defensive line coach. You've also got um, Deion Barnes there as his graduate assistant with one more year left. But Deion, you know, has been a grad, grad assistant for two years. And typically it's two years and out. But with COVID, they all got an extra year. 
Um, so that'll be interesting to see his situation because he's so vital for Penn State's efforts in Philadelphia. So if John Scott does move on, you got to think he's in the mix there. Um, as I mentioned, no linebackers coach. So Penn State fans probably finally going to get their wish and get a linebackers coach uh, di- directed to the position. Uh, and then the back end, you've got Terry Smith, uh, who's been a part of that inner circle, as you mentioned, with James Franklin and Anthony Poindexter, who's a really interesting one because he is an outsider. He is a guy that, you know, was uh, was at Purdue before he has coordinator experience. So does he get the interim DC tag? Probably. Um, That would be my thought. Um, But uh, that's an interesting one there. I don't see a situation where he ends up at tech with, uh, with Brent Pry. He is a UVA lifer. I mean, if if he were to go anywhere, you think it would be Virginia. Um, So, and and that's obviously not uh, with, with Bronco Mendenhall there. It's not really open right now. So uh, a lot of parts to be moved. Uh, I think when you look at uh, this as a Penn state fan, you wanted to see your attrition come from the offensive side of the ball after this season, but really not a surprise. And as I said, Brent Pry, Great guy, great soldier for Penn State. Really, really happy for him. And uh, he didn't just settle for a job. He went out and got a really good one. Yeah, and I encourage Virginia Tech fans, uh, you know, however they are feeling on their message boards right now, to hold off and and give this guy a shot because I'm telling you, endearing is a great word to describe him. You referenced that word before. They see him on a press conference talking about his plans for, for what he wants to do with that program. I think they'll start to get on board. But, of course, uh, when, when you when you have certain names you want in a coaching search, and one comes out of left field, and it's a guy who doesn't have the head coaching experience. Yeah, that that, that can that can feel underwhelming for some fan bases. I, I get that. Brent Pry though has some familiarity with that program. He was a graduate assistant down at Virginia Tech in, in the mid 1990s. Uh, three decades now of coaching experience, and in the last decade plus with James Franklin. Uh, in the last 12 years, Sean, including that his last year at Georgia Southern, um, five uh, top 25 defenses in eight of those 12 years. Uh, this year, Penn State ranking second in or seventh in scoring defense, second in the Big Ten, allowing 16.8 yards per game on average. And we've talked about this a lot. Yes, the, the losses racked up for this team down the stretch, but uh, the defense, time and time again, um, with very few exceptions, put their team in position to come away with the victory at the end, gave the offense a chance. Um, it has never been really the the defense feeling the scrutiny this year uh, as so much as has been the offense. It wasn't a perfect season, but I thought it was a real strong bounce back year for Brent Pry because it went off the wa- wheels midway through that 2020 year. And, and, and a lot of things did during the pandemic, but defensively it was a mess. You saw improvements down the stretch. And I thought they came back this year with a, with some key transfer pickups and really put together a nice game plan and, and ultimately we're over able to over, over able to overcome easy for me to say some really important losses. It wasn't easy getting past losing a guy like PJ Mustafer and Adiza Isaac, but a little creativity, some depth issues. And I thought Brent Pry ultimately put together just about as strong as a defense as you were looking for. Although the shortcoming is they didn't really get the progression that you were hoping for from some of those linebackers. Yeah. And I mean, what do we say after every game? This is not on the defense. So yeah. uh, Penn State's seven and five record, certainly not on the defense. There were certainly uh, things that you could nitpick at and and definitely, um, you know, take home and, and, you know, put that film in and try and fix. But, um, you know, that's that's good. Uh, I, lo- I look back at some of my messages to Pry. I reached out to him during the pandemic just to, to get a get a stronger hold on what his defense was. And basically he kind of, um, he didn't shove me away, but he, he basically said, there's no, there's no scheme for this. There's no books for this or anything like that. It's, it's Bud Foster. He's, he's a, he considers himself a Bud Foster disciple, um, you know, single gap defense, aggressive with pressure uh, coverage variety. Um, you know, that's all Beamer. I, I, I'll be interested to see when he's introduced, how many times he mentions Frank Beamer, how many times he mentions Bud Foster, because he is really, really wrapped up in that. And, looking back at my messages, Virginia tech makes a lot of sense now. Um, so happy for him. And, and yeah, it's going to be interesting because you've got, uh, you've got to replace some guys on the defensive side of the ball. They did so with transfers last year. They did a heck of a job with, with transfers last year, but now you're losing veteran guys in the back end, like Brisker and, and, and Castro fields. Uh, you'll see what happens with linebacker um, with, with those guys cycling through there. Um, Lucetta, you still think is going to, is going to go pro and Ebikiti is, is a guy that you have to replace. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So, you know, the timing fits from that aspect too for Brent Pry because he's going to have to uh, figure out a way or whoever the next guy is is going to have to figure out a way to to recalibrate that defense. It's going to be an interesting reset in the linebacker room where we've had questions. What body types are you looking for in the recruiting trail? What positional fits make sense for your scheme? It's been kind of a, a consistent question with some of the blue chips they've brought in during recent years. And we've seen guys ultimately transition to different roles in year two or year three. 
Right now, you're looking at losing uh, losing Ellis Brooks as that super senior. Brand Smith's got a decision to make because of all that athleticism in his pedigree. And, and then you got Curtis Jacobs coming back, and you'd like to see him take a step forward. But we talked about it. Depth has been an issue. Um, you're still wondering who's ready to step up from that group. And, of course, now you throw in new leadership in that room. This entire linebacker room was hand-selected one way or another, in part with, with Brent Pry involved. So it's going to be a really interesting reset, reset to me. And, and we're also going to have to, of course, uh, assess what this might mean for recruiting a couple of weeks shy of signing day. Yeah, that, that'll that be the interesting one to me. I've got the commitment list open right now going through it. Nobody really jumps out in terms of guys that would leave because Pry's leaving now. John Scott goes. That that might be something to look at with some of those uh, other defensive coaches. I, th- I found it interesting that you look at Zane Durant's in-home visit last night, and he had most of the defensive staff there. Pry was not there. John Scott was there. So I thought that was interesting. Um, Deny has an in-home visit uh, this week on Thursday, so they're going to go in there and, and hard sell that one to try, try and put out those fires. It's a good time. Time for the coaches to be on the road, to be honest with you. But uh, guys like Ken Talley and, and Keon Wiley, Dion Barnes is still in the house, so that makes sense. So um, I think they'll be, um, I think they'll be okay. I, th- there might be some some attrition here and there, but uh, I don't think it's a situation where you're you're finding yourself uh, scrambling here at the end. I think probably the biggest thing here is not not so much the commitments, but you're still chasing Jay Sean Barham. You want to make a, a, a run for Derek Moore, the Oklahoma D commit at St. Francis, going to go into St. Francis tomorrow with James Franklin and, and a bunch of those uh, assistant coaches. So that's probably the most interesting dynamic to me is, is you're kind of in a holding pattern for a guy like Barham um, because you've been recruiting him so long. Now, at the same time, he just took an, a, an official visit to Oklahoma. So that one kind of blew up in his face. So that'll, that'll be very interesting to me to see how they in the last two weeks of this cycle can put out the fires turn it around and, and maybe try and benefit from it i'm not saying that that's definitely going to happen but you've got to be proactive and and we know known that james franklin has been that in in the past it's it's kind of uh here you, you know our assistants you love our assistants but i've got the 10-year contract as james franklin so i'm going to be here so trust in my vision and that's what he's got to sell to these guys and there is also a bit of a holding holding pattern going on right now with some of the veterans on this defense who do have those tough decisions to make. They're going to want to have that conversation with whoever the new defensive coordinator is, get a better understanding of their role, their their how they factor into those plans. Guys like PJ Mustafer, Jesse Lucetta, Brandon Smith, Jair Brown. You go down the list. Some of those cornerbacks, perhaps even a guy like Joey Porter Jr. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot balancing between the NFL draft and where guys might think they are as professional prospects, and also you know guys who have that extra year of eligibility, but maybe maybe are not sure if they want to stay on a campus. That could be a tipping point. The the, the higher they make, the conversation that occurs immediately after it, because you're going to have to do some internal recruiting along with some external recruiting in the transfer portal and and, and with the signing day coming up, not just in December, but the second one in February, if if you can squeeze anything out of that. Yeah, and that's why it's important. Keep Terry Smith, keep Anthony Poindexter, you know, keep those guys that can 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 talk these guys and and, and quell those fears uh, a little bit. And you know, I think they'll they'll be all right with this and 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 we'll see where this thing stands. I haven't done much in terms of looking, you know, this is something that popped up on our radar earlier. Well, I guess it was over the weekend, um, because th- there was a thread on our board about the Louisiana job, and I was like, hey guys. It's not really the Louisiana job. It's more about the Virginia Tech job, which is obviously changes the dynamic, changes the conversation quite a bit. Um, so I haven't done a ton into defensive coordinator. Um, you know, Jim Knowles is one that jumps out at Oklahoma State. He's a Philly guy. Um, you know, you could see that that potentially being there. I, I'll be honest. Uh, I don't know which direction Franklin would go. Is it a young, you know, after watching someone like Marcus Freeman, who's going to be the head coach at or the interim head coach, at least at Notre Dame, uh, by the time this thing publishes, I mean, do you go that route and try to get a young guy and try to bolster your recruiting and 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 have a guy that learns on the job, or do you go with the old veteran um, on the other side? It'll, it'll be very fascinating to see how this uh, how this all works out. And can you find a guy that is ready to stick around for a little while? Because uh, that that's also something that Franklin has talked about: um, stability with your coaching staff. Can, can you avoid a one and done kind of situation? I know that's hard to predict. And you don't want to shortchange your coaching staff search because a guy who maybe will get that next opportunity after a year is probably an ascending figure. But that's also a factor here, I think, as well for James Franklin when it comes to recruiting and cultivating what he wants to do with this program. Uh, been a revolving door on, at the other coordinator position a lot lately, and, and I think we've seen the ramifications on the field. 
We'll see if they can get someone who, who's maybe ready to buy in for for at least a few years uh, at defensive coordinator. That's part. That's a factor, I believe. Sean, you yeah, mentioned and, it. And, then, another, and sorry, yeah. I don't mean to trample on you. The last no, time no. they did it, the last time they did it, Pry was obvious. I mean, this was one that then when when they needed to replace Bob Shoup, Brent Pry was the obvious guy. Um, this one uh, not so obvious because Poindexter's only been here for a year. Terry Smith, I don't know if he's going to you know put his put his name in there for the the, the coordinator job, but Pry was an obvious um, promotion right there, and I don't think it's it's outwardly obvious with this this time around. You mentioned the Notre Dame job being open right now. We'll see if Freeman is ultimately the guy that they stick with and, and, and do an internal promotion there. But Brian Kelly's off to LSU. Um, <laughs> you've got the Florida job now with Billy Napier. Of course, uh, USC now taking Lincoln Riley away from Oklahoma. Just How in the that, past, man? I mean, it's just been unbelievable. You know, we talked about James Franklin being at the center of all the speculation. I don't think anybody saw the headlines coming that we have seen in the past 72 hours or so, and there are more to come, but the head coach is sticking here in happy Valley. The defensive coordinator may not be, but James Franklin's still running the show. There is a lot of things in flux with two weeks away from the early signing period. Can Penn state benefit from chaos here? Yes. Um, with the, with the caveat that they've got 25 commits right now and right, there's right. not much room to benefit with it from a 20, from a 2022 perspective. I mean, you can go into those living rooms and go into, uh, 2023 schools right now and say, Hey, I'm locked up for a long time. These guys are leaving without even telling their players. Um, you know, you look at that, that that's a bad look for Brian Kelly with, which cracked me up by the way, the, the message that he sent first apologizing for the late text. And, Oh, I also wanted to tell you that I'm going to LSU. That's kind of how it works these days, man. And it's and it's chaos. Um, everybody's talking about the um, paying players and how that's going to end college football. But geez, man, look at this. Ten ten million dollars are reported for Brian Kelly and um, Lincoln Riley's house in Norman being bought for a million or five hundred thousand dollars over asking. For, I mean, just all this stuff revolving around the coaches, which is really funny when you look at the players and, and you're basically crowdfunding for paying the players. And then you're, you're doing this with the coaches. Um, it's all pretty amazing stuff. Um, but I will say this, you look at USC and that's the thing that we talked about with, with James Franklin and USC is we didn't think they would spend the money to, um, to do things because that's been the standard operating procedure for so many years. USC went out and they spent a <laughs> boatload of money on Lincoln Riley. That's a heck of a commitment to that program, to getting it back where they're going. And I mean, from, from Lincoln Riley's perspective, he's not going into the SEC West or whatever pod Oklahoma was going to be in. So that's a, that's an interesting move right there. And then LSU comes back and splashes the pot even more. And just, it's, it's, it's really amazing how this stuff has worked through this and we we sat down with Brandon Short to talk about the, the the dynamics of college football and how this works from a Penn State perspective and I know it's going to sound really stupid coming off a 7 and 5 year and nobody's happy with that obviously but Penn State almost getting ahead of the game and I don't want to say getting in cheap with James Franklin's contract cuz that's a heck of a lot of money for anybody um but getting ahead of the double digit millions of dollars per year contracts that are going around right now is just really just unbelievable how this has all worked out. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a commitment to, to winning. And I know that people feel dirty saying that, but that's uh, these are going to be the programs I think that, that rise in the next couple of years. If there was any doubt about resources being available to James Franklin beyond state college, they were there, but they went to a different coach. You do wonder how five losses in seven games and, and, and that turmoil in the middle of the season, the three game losing streak, how that impacted everything, what may have been on the table versus what may have ultimately been taken off the table for James Franklin. Lincoln Riley got paid. Brian Kelly got paid. James Franklin got, got paid a little bit less. Uh, but ultimately right now, to your point, it feels like Penn State is able to kind of look out for, from its campus and see a lot of fires burning across college football. And despite finishing seven and five, they can get a jump start, like you said, on this offseason and start building while other programs are trying to trying to just stay above water right now and, and, and come to their senses and, and find out what's next for them. Yeah, and meanwhile, there's a college football playoff with Cincinnati involved, and Michigan's going to make it, and uh, there's a lot, uh, a lot of fun, fun things going on. By the way, Lincoln Riley's "I'm not going to be the coach at LSU," and then turning around and going to USC is just wow, that is a <laughs> chef's kiss right there. Just uh, unbelievable how this stuff has all played out. But I mean, that's uh, if if you're going, if someone's going to pay you 100 million dollars, you're probably gonna you're probably gonna bite at it. So I'm I'm not blaming people for taking those jobs and running with them, but. Man, that's a lot. Uh, that's a lot going on in college football right now. 
there's a ton happening. Um, there's also a lot happening right here in Happy Valley. And, and to get some perspective on that, we'll turn to Brennan Short, um, who joined us earlier on in the year to talk about why he felt like a long-term investment for the football program made a ton of sense. Shouldn't be a surprise. We're talking about an All-American linebacker, but he was motivated to run for the Board of Trustees. And you'll hear exactly his vantage point on the entire Franklin contract. What comes next right now? Well, as we've learned lately in college football or relearned, uh, news happens fast and news gets buried fast. But here at Penn State, I think what happened last week with the contract for James Franklin will be dissected in the weeks, months and potentially years to come by Penn State fans, by national media. A lot of coaching changes happening across the country, as we've seen in the last 72 hours, not happening right here, at least the head coach position with James Franklin. And uh, part of that whole process, as we've been focusing on the board of trustees and the subcommittee for compensation that met last Tuesday, um, but part of the whole board of trustees process, of course, Brandon Short, um, who joins us now on the Lions 24-7 process, uh, a podcast. He was with us earlier this year um, during his re-election campaign for the Board of Trustees, fortunately very successful in that endeavor, and he remains with the BOT. Brandon, former All-American linebacker, we will talk about defense. We'll talk about linebackers in a bit, but we do want to pick your brain quite a bit on the James Franklin news that surfaced last week. We understand and we've talked a lot about from the perspective of why James Franklin might be motivated to, to figure out a long-term deal here. What was Penn State's main interest in getting this done from your vantage point? Well, I mean, a, a big part is to is to stabilize sort of the the university and the the team. That you know, I, I don't that sort of envy the position that you see some of the the teams in now, um, Oklahoma or Notre Dame, where they're scrambling to find a head coach. Um, and it's two weeks before, you know, the the signing day. You know, the, James Franklin, the, in, in, in my view, he, he's received a lot of interest um, over the years that he's been at Penn State. But, you know, I believe, you know, James never you know, really wanted to leave. You know, he's a Pennsylvania guy. His family's grown root here, roots here, and Penn State, you know, is a great place. But what I do believe is that, you know, James thinks that, you know, that us as leaders, we need to align and you know, make the commitment, you know, necessary to take the team um, to the next level. You know, over over the past you know, year, you know, I've come on the show and there's been you know, debate about facilities, but facilities is a, a part of that commitment, but it's only part of the commitment. You know, it's about having and you know, investing in assistant coaches, and being able to keep your assistant coaches. It's about hiring a pro analysts to help come up with game plans, um, nutritionists, training table. You know, having someone to focus on name, image, and likeness to give us a competitive advantage in the market. You know, having people to do um, help increase salaries and support academic support center. You know that. You know, Ohio State outspends Penn State every year by $12 million. And, you know, in order to compete at that level, we need to make the investments commensurate to that level. And I think that we're doing it. We're, Penn, we're in a transition phase now. You know, Sandy, you know, has made that commitment. You know, our leadership, you know, is aligned with doing the things necessary to give, you know, our people the tools necessary to win. Why, why the timing of this one? I, I, I know when we talked to James Franklin, he had talked about um, this coming up in either late September, early October, something like that. Penn State's still undefeated at the time. But um, about making these fixes, is it just about getting ahead of the rest of or trying to get ahead of the rest of college football? Is it just um, because that's I, I don't want to say that's locked into the long term plan, but why the timing of this commitment from Penn State? Well, I mean, we the, uh, the the contract negotiation started early on, you know, in, in the year, and it just goes to the point that it it's not really about the dollar amount, as you can see, the exorbitant dollar amounts coming out with you know some of the recent signings of head coaches. You know, it, it was about being able to align on broader commitments to investing in the, in, in the program, which takes a little bit more time because it's not just the putting. Um, pen to paper um, and that we you want to have this type of deal done before the end of the season because you see as soon as that the, the season is over you see the the bedlam that's taking place in college football in terms 
you know, uh, of new of coaching changes and position changes. And we felt that it was important to lock, you know, James down and, you know, at least stabilize, you know, what, what our, our track for the future um, before the end of the season. Yeah, we heard from James that the, you know this was something that maybe surfaced in September very seriously, getting the parameters settled and trying to figure out the long-term plan. You talked about alignment. How about the alignment among the board of trustees in terms of getting enough people on board with moving forward with a huge move like this, a major financial investment? Um, I know you can't necessarily take us behind closed doors, but was there a battle that took place over these recent months? No, I, I don't think it was a battle. It's just, you know, people, the individuals doing their fiduciary duties, you know, asking the pertinent questions that they should be asking when you're making these type of investments. And, you know, uh, and you know, I appreciate that. And the, those questions should be asked, but it is necessary to help take our program um, to the, the, the next level. You know, there, it's no secret that the teams, the Alabama, Clemson, um, Ohio State, the teams that consistently compete and are, are in the playoffs, make those levels of investments. And now, you know, teams like us, Penn State, that are on 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 the edge, that we are making those investments now so that we can we can get there. So like a, an analogy is like a, a coaches are put in place to help player put players in position to make plays. And that's that's their job and they control the game. But it's the administration's job to provide the coaches with the tools necessary that they need to put those players in position to win games. Now, the coaches have a bigger effect on football because administration, my responsibility as a board member is to the entire university, not athletics, not just athletics. But we are now we're committed to doing that and committed to, to winning. Is there much debate on this? I mean, are their minds changed throughout this process? I mean, obviously, some people get in their ways and, and want to stick with that. But how does this how do you talk as a board about pushing um, this, as you say, in the right direction? I mean, what, what, is, is it a process to get people across the line, get votes or anything like that? Or is it just here's the, here's the facts. This is where we need to be. And let's just just come to a head on it. No, it's a it's a process. And it, it's about getting getting buy in from people. There are a lot of smart people, you know, in the, in that room. And there's some people with egos, some bigger, some bigger than others. And you know, it's about coming to you know agreement on you know what what we feel is best, you know, collectively, you know, for for the university. And you know, the, and everybody isn't going to always agree. But if you got two people in a room and they agree on everything, you don't need one. You don't need one of them. So. <laughs> From your standpoint, what what has changed for the board of trustees to get this stuff done? Are, are there uh, we we know that there have been financial hurdles in the back in, in the past. Um, what has it really changed for getting funding, approving funding? Is there a, a I, I, you know we've heard about the limits for how much you can spend versus how much you can just go ahead and and finance, make these decisions. What has changed from the board standpoint on getting stuff done? Maybe the smaller things. And just to, just to, just another a clarifying point too that Penn State is one of only twelve schools nationally that has a self-funded athletic department, meaning that our anything that we spend on athletics is funded by athletics itself, and it doesn't no tuition dollars are taken away, no tax dollars are used for any of these salaries, and football frankly funds most of it, funds everything. Um, and what has changed? It's the market. I mean, the, there there are business people on that board, and they see. You know, coaches being signed for 10 million, some 12 million, you know, a year. And they can see the budgets and they can look at, you know, the strategic importance to the football program, to the university. And if we don't foster that and don't invest in it, we're making a decision not to compete. So it's, it's just basic. You know, it's it's economics and it's people that understand the numbers and that, you know, get, you know, the the strategy. You know, when there, there's so many changes, you know, in coaching and an analogy that that can that makes it more clear. Something that resonates with me is like I, there, James has had a lot of interest, and for another school to come and take our coach analogy is like someone coming to take your spouse. That you can choose to to separate amicably and go your own ways, but if someone comes in and can take your spouse. You got to take a look at look at yourself and think what went wrong. What are we doing wrong? 
and at some of these universities you know, that you know they are, are willing to throw money they're willing to make these investments and if we're not willing to step up and and, and match or do something similar, then we're just not willing to compete. Brandon, we can point to those three 11 win seasons in a four year span, but the further you get away from it, I guess the less water it carries for a lot of people. If someone were to kind of come to you and, and say, why does this make sense for Penn State when the team has finished under 500 in the Big Ten the last couple of years? Make of 2020 what you will, but the record is what it is since 2019. What is your counterpoint to that argument? Because we have certainly heard a lot of that about the last two year sample size and people having a tough time correlating that with a long term commitment here. Yeah. And, and I understand. And it's it's a fair question. And that to be clear, you know, seven and five, five and five, seven and five is disappointing and, and not acceptable. But we're not we're not, we're not making that decision you know, based upon the past year or or two, COVID was an anomaly. And I don't want to make any, any excuses for anyone, but that was different. But, and there's been a lot of other, you know, things that have happened around the program with, you know, losing Journey Brown, not playing, not having Micah Parsons, but not being able to, to play uh, on, on our team. But, you know, we have been a New Year's 16, you know, consistently uh, uh, in the past. And that, we believe that, at least I believe, that the program is still on the right track. A, a perfect example is that we got two guys competing for Rookie of the Year in the NFL. You look at you look at any team and you see all NFL players. That that's people from Penn State. You got Brett Pry is a top candidate for the Virginia Tech job right now. You know that we have off our offensive coordinators being poached for head coaching jobs. Everyone everyone taking steps up. So. Uh, James Franklin actually has a coaching family tree now. When you look out, you can see all the different places where you know people have come through um, Penn State and have, have been successful. Even the guy down at LSU, I can't even think of the guy's name, but he's they they're all they all you know have done well coming from Penn State. And I think that we're we're on the right track. Um, and we are be we are more aligned than we've ever been. And I think the future is bright. We have one of the top recruiting classes in the country, you know, right right now. The top quarterback, top running back coming to Penn State next year. Brandon, what what's next now? Now that this thing is is off the table, you got that taken care of. What what from your viewpoint as a board member, as someone who obviously has heavy contacts in the football program, what are they going to? Uh, what's the next step? We've seen that lashes is, is under construction, the weight room uh, extension. We've there's been talk about training table, moving that over there. What's next in your view um, to get Penn State uh, to to take a step forward? I mean, just to to go out and and make it happen. I mean, we have to do the best we can to retain our assistant coaches or and and you know or, or be able to to be nimble and react quickly when there is an opening so if there's a Brett Pry, if he goes to Virginia Tech we got to be able to react quickly and bring somebody in that can that can really you know shore up the team and shore up you know recruiting you know, we have to be able to to you know do things like training table and you know the bringing in more quality control assistance from the NFL to break down game tape. You know, you look at Alabama; they have three former pro head coaches breaking down tape. You know, who like so they're going to have a strategic advantage because they have one of those coaches just looking at you know um, one team looking at LSU all year. And then he has it, the guesses what you, we think you should do, and Saban says yes or no, or Brian says yes or no. So it, it's um, it's about getting it done, you know, going out and making it happen. James mentioned last week after practice when this contract news surfaced, um, you know, kind of reaffirming he wants 365 day commitment from himself from the university. It's not just about those 12 Saturdays on the fall schedule. They also mentioned that that means three or four extra blue trips a year. If you do it right on recruiting, you've done this, lived the life of, of a coveted recruit. How can Penn State here in the next couple of years with what Franklin's talking about for his vision and what I'm assuming you discussed uh, at, with the board of trustees, how can this maybe help bring more talent, retain talent here in Penn State? I mean, it, it moves it exponentially forward. You know, that like you, you have even our recruits tweeting, going out recruiting other people like the, the Oklahoma and um, Notre Dame guys said, telling them, look, you, you want a coach that's not going anywhere for a while. You, you, you come here. 
you know, one, one of the one of the biggest issues that we've had, you know, from I'm a football guy as well perspective, but the, like this past few years has been depth. You know, we we had linebacker, we had safeties playing linebacker and linebacker playing defensive end, playing defensive end. You know, so like and, and if you don't have that depth in those positions, you know, you lose your starting defensive tackle. PJ Mustafer goes down and they rush for 300 yards the next game. <laughs> that people don't realize, you know, that that's that has a big effect. So having more depth and you know being able to 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 bring more talent in, you know, at the you know at the quarterback position, you know, is is going to be key. Brandon, from building off of that, just but also going a completely different way, the stability really helps with recruiting. It really helps with with selling your program. How does that help, or how does that change things with the donor aspect of it? How how do you go out and you know you say you got James Franklin for ten more years? How how does that change um, Sandy Barber's job in terms of going out and raising money, getting the stuff that she needs um, to complete these projects to get these things rolling? Yeah, it, it, I believe it helps. I mean, the, the, the donors, they understand who's going to be there. They have, you know, a, a clear view. They may not be as happy because of the, like everyone, no one's happy with, with, you know, with last season, you know, from Penn State and the season before that. But I, I do believe that it, it, it does help. And one of the challenges that we face is just, it's, it's, it's such a good thing is we haven't had a booster culture at Penn State. There hasn't been there's not a culture where there are people that are big money people that have been close to the program that have that have had influence largely because we had like like Joe Paterno was the coach and you know he necessarily did, wouldn't take their influence even if they offered it at the at those times so we don't have that culture but we need to, we we need to cultivate it frankly we need to build that culture where like Penn State as the the top school for chief executive officers in the world not Harvard not Penn Penn State so we i mean there there are the people out there that you know have the the have the resources and the wherewithal to give back to the university and it's about it's up to Sandy and us and you know others on the development team to go out and you know explain to them the benefits to them and to the university of making those type of contributions what's that pitch on. like oh, sorry sorry Tyler but what's that pitch no like when you go to a mega millions donor or something like that and you and you say this is yeah I understand four and five last year seven and five this year here's the future here's the vision what's the what's the pitch like from you guys as a board to uh to to, to get these things done it, it it depends on the donor the, the, an honest answer depends Sounds on about what right. it is. <laughs> but it's about the future so like the, 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 okay we we approved lash in like last year Right. But it's not it's not complete. The recruit people haven't even seen the building yet. It's just a spec. So you can't we're not recruiting off of that now. So we're making decisions today that are going to affect us in in the long term, which is why one of the points that we make, we don't want to be short sighted. Another analogy, and I hate to use this because I have a, a special disdain for the University of Michigan. But last year, Jim Harbaugh was out. There, there was no everybody thought that he was done and the, and, you know, they should fire him and get rid of him. And this year he's the big Big Ten East champ and probably going to the playoffs. And I and it hurts me to say that. Let me tell you. But it, it's it's true. And Michigan made that commitment. They, they thought they looked at Harbaugh and they thought that he could he could get it done. And I think that James, James even more so than Harbaugh in last year, I believe he can get it done. On the field, Brandon, you've worn this Nittany Lions uniform. I know you've had high expectations for a rebound season coming off of 2020. They started 5-0. and They're leading at Iowa. They're number four in the country. Now here we are talking about a 7-5 and squad, going to go to a bowl game that, that none of us kind of projected them to be in. What did you make of this season? Because a lot of us got whiplash covering this team. Yeah, it's... I mean, it was, it was disappointing. We started off well, but a point that I made, it was the depth. So Sean Clifford doesn't go down in that Iowa game. And if Sean Clifford's healthy the entire season, who knows what could happen? And another, another, another big loss to the team this year was PJ Mustafer. We don't look, we are undefeated with PJ Mustafer in the top 14. You know, he's the captain of our team. He went down midway in the Iowa game. And the next next week, you know, the team rushes for 300 yards. Now the guys that are behind PJ are great players and they they develop. 
but there there were some growing pains in that, that Illinois game. So that the, the people don't realize that 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 the depth you know at those key positions is so important. And you know it's sometimes you know it's it's better to be lucky than good. You know we haven't had the ball bounce our way. I'm a I'm an athlete. I'm not one to make an excuse about weather conditions or injuries or anything that are out of your control. But you know just things haven't did they didn't go our way. Brandon, what, what's what's the roadmap here? Um, you know, you talk about the the on field stuff, but you mentioned a couple schools earlier: Alabama, o- Ohio State, Clemson. I think you could probably throw you could probably throw Georgia in there, LSU, some of those guys. Um, I think Michigan and, and Notre Dame are kind of on the fringe as well. Um, what is the roadmap? What it, what are you looking to as a board, as a coaching staff, as an administration looking to replicate here? Well, I can't speak for the entire board. I can only speak for myself, but that it's just making that commitment. Again, it is putting the, the, the coaching staff, giving them every opportunity to be successful and making that investment. And there's no guarantee that it's going to yield results, but it increases the probability. It increases the chances. So I want to do everything that I can to help the, and support the program so that they can be successful, so that we can have fund our entire athletic program so that the university can be successful. So Penn and Penn state can prosper. I know the LBU brand is near and dear to your heart. So what did you think about the 12 games that you saw from Nittany Lions linebackers here in 2021? And as you reference Brent Pry, by the time people listen to this podcast, may be introduced as the head coach down at Virginia tech, based on the reports that were surfacing this morning, if he is gone, what do you think are the most important aspects Penn State should be looking for in their next defensive coordinator? Well, I thought the the, the linebackers played well. You know, they, they Jesse Lucetta, they moved him down the defensive end. He played linebacker. You know, like Brandon Smith. You know, that that we we have you know a solid solid linebacker crew, and we're hoping to try to keep some of these guys. You know, that they, they don't they don't go on to the next level, but if they do, hope they're they're making the right decisions for them. Um, in terms of what's next, you know, I, again, I, I can only give you my opinion. You know, I don't speak for the board. I don't speak for, for the coaching staff. But, you know, Brett Price is an excellent defensive coordinator. You know, and, you know, I hope that we're able to retain him. But if he goes on to be head coach at Virginia Tech, you know, we wish him the best. He's just another member of our family that's moving on. But we need to have someone that in that position is going to come in and just and set a standard for, for tackling and for setting a mentality of, of Penn State defense the same way Tom Bradley did and the same way Brett, Brett Pry has done. Yeah, Pry took over for Bob Shoup, essentially kept, kept the same defense. I mean, you as a defensive guy, as a linebacker, I mean, how, how much would you like to see this, this defense replicated by the next guy? I know that's not necessarily something that you can go out and say, hey, run run Brent Pry's defense or run Bob Shoup's defense, but how much would you like to see this this defensive momentum that Penn State have continue? Well, well, I, I like. The, I don't want to see the defense replicate it because it, whatever scheme I want to see, whoever comes in, they have a scheme, they have a they have a, a philosophy, and we overlay that with our Penn, the the Penn State mentality. I want to see them do what works. You know, it could be a three four four three man schemes versus zone schemes, a blitzing, whatever works. That the scheme should be adapted to your players. So you can come in and take a look at what you have. If you can get to the quarterback with four, then you don't blitz at all. You just sit back and you just like sick sick your defensive line on them. But if you need to if you need to blitz people, then you blitz and then you're going to do zone or man. So it 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 all depends on the personnel and the scheme. A, a, a good coach, Joe Joe Paterno, used to always say it's not like the scheme; it's the the players, and you adapt that scheme to the players. Brandon, you I know you are a big fan of Micah Parsons, and now he has become a very big time national name based on his start to the NFL with his rookie season. What have you seen from Micah Parsons playing a couple of different positions with the Dallas Cowboys? And how big is this for that LVU brand that I just mentioned? Oh, man, it it, it, it is tremendous. And Micah, I'm just so proud of him. Just I, I mean, I saw him come in from from Harrisburg. Uh, uh, as a kid and develop into a young man, you know, graduated with a 3.3 grade point average and is just like giving back in his community. I'm just so proud of him as a person, but him as a player, he's phenomenal. 
He's, he's 250 pounds and runs faster than Saquon Barkley. He, he ta timed. So, and he comes and he come and he meets you with an attitude. So it, it, it is, it, it's not surprising to me that he's taken the, the NFL by storm because his physical attributes and his mentality, more importantly, leads him to be successful. Just so proud of him. And Jason Alway and all the other and all of our other players. Shaka Tony had two sacks last night. So so you look, you go out and look at all the players that we have out there, and you know, I see that you know we're we're on the right track. Last question for you. Um, if we're talking again, let's say uh, the last day of next November, and we're looking at a team that's got double digit wins, and we're talking about a different postseason picture, what went right for Penn State in this upcoming offseason? <sighs> Stabilizing the run, creating a running game, um, you know, basically, you know, being able to, you know, finish games. You know, we we we've been had a chance to win every football game. It means we can we play we can play with anybody. But you know, when you're up, being able to finish, and when you're you're close, being able to take that extra step to 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 make it happen. And I and I believe they can. I mean, they they have all the tools. Uh, we don't know. Hopefully, Brett Pratt comes back as defensive coordinator. But you know, if not, there's still the talent there to make it happen. And we'll hopefully Sandy and James will go act nimbly and bring you know somebody in that's going to you know carry on that that defensive tradition. Brandon, I, know, I hate to say this, but oh. you're 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 now part of the old guard. How much did it it hurt to see Penn State the this 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 lineage of running backs not have a running game this year? Yeah, it was it was disappointing. You know, it was hard to understand. You know, <laughs> frankly, it's hard to understand you know, how um, that that happened. I mean, you have you know, there's you know a lot of guys that that you know had talent, but it wasn't. We just never got it going. You know, I don't. We never. I don't think we committed to a back. You know, we committed to there was running back back committee. Um, just my opinion, <laughs> what it's worth. But you know, if you have five backs, you don't have any. Brandon Short was an All-American linebacker at Penn State, uh, now with the Board of Trustees, and now back in the United States uh, after spending the time overseas in the UK. Brandon, welcome back. Enjoy that view of the New York City skyline, and we hope to catch up with you real soon here on the podcast. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks again to Brandon. Um, great to have him on as a repeat guest. I think we talked about this the first time he joined us uh, late last winter, early spring. One of the few Penn State jerseys you own, um, I believe, was a Brandon Short um, and he's a guy that, you know, hopefully we can keep on tapping on his shoulder and having him on here to, to provide some perspective because uh, 25, 30 minutes, whatever he gave us, a lot to piece through there. Yeah, um, there's a lot going on there. Um, and, and really, it's about that commitment that we talked about before the break. I mean, just kind of throwing yourself, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of money thrown around in college football over the next 10 years. And I think you're setting yourself up to to be in that position to spend um, to, to to really compete. And it's it's a choice. I mean, let's be honest with you. And I know you, a lot of people are making the facilities joke right now about beating Illinois and all that stuff. And whatever but i mean it's it, it's one of those things where you're setting yourself up for the long term and whether it's franklin or whomever is going to be um at the helm in 10 years um putting yourself to be in a position where you're competing with alabama competing with ohio state clemson lsu georgia whatever it, it may be i mean it's it, it that's the way the sport is headed and i know it's tough to to wrap your head around but uh it's gonna be it's gonna be crazy to see how this comes together there's a lot of um a lot of things um philosophically that they could do that really wouldn't cost them much money that, that I think they've kind of drug their feet on. And I think they're starting to get it. And it'll be interesting to see as they transition to a new president, to eventually a new athletic director, how much change actually comes with that. And it was nice to learn that Brandon Short also confused by the running back results here in 2021. So, well, you know, company one in of that us, regard. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, Sean, the transfer portal. Yeah. Yes. Well, the, the, the coaching carousel caught on fire a, a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago, we could really say a few months ago, let's just say with James Franklin. But when it comes to the transfer portal, this Monday that follows the final weekend of the regular season is just ridiculous um we saw him playing out across the 24 7 sports network uh yesterday chris hummer doing a great job for our national team uh, keeping track on who's entering a bunch of former blue chips spencer rattler was a marquee addition there on monday uh, you know guy who people thought might be the number one pick in the next nfl draft now he's looking for a new team 
But here in Happy Valley, haven't broken any news of a transfer portal departure yet. Tyler Rudolph hit the portal last week. That was expected. Was absent from the team for the final stretch of the season. Now, this will change, but quiet so far in State College comparatively. Well, it's only been one day, essentially, and it feels like it's been a, a lot longer day. than that. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna, we were, we were set to record this morning before the prize stuff, and, and I was gonna say Penn State made it through one day unscathed. It's not gonna happen, um, you know, the, with uh, with coaches with with portals. Um, I, I think it will be a slower burn um, with portal stuff for Penn State. You've got so, a, a lot of dynamics at play here. You've got guys that uh, you know are. Well, first off, the coach is on the road, so you want to see some conversations maybe next week about it. I think there's some obvious candidates there, and I don't like to speculate on transfers, but there's there's going to be attrition. Um, but I think it's going to be spread out a little bit more this week, next week, um, you know, over the holidays to get somebody in, into January. And then you're going to have a wave in the new year where those guys will come back be on scholarship that whether it's finishing, finishing out their degree or, or what have you. So I don't think it's going to be a situation where you see some schools that are putting four and five guys into the, into the portal at one time. I don't think that's going to be the situation at Penn state. There will be attrition. Very, very confident. There will be attrition. And, you know, to be honest with you with the number of guys that they've taken and the number of guys that they want to continue to add through the portal with the wiggle room that they have um, in the, in, with the new NCA rules, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of, uh, of when it comes uh, what, and how hard it hits. Uh, so that'll, that'll be an interesting thing. Um, you know, you've got two weeks until the early signing period. You want to, you know, reassess your staff and in, in, in terms of what you have on both sides of the ball and figure out where you're at going into the bowl game, which will be announced on Sunday. So there's a lot of, a lot of stuff happening right now, but at the same time, um, you're gonna, I think you're going to have to be patient. I think that that that's true with the portal as well. By the way, I put my notifications on for the 24-7 uh, portal oh, yeah. uh, account to send to my phone. I think that might have been a mistake because there is a <laughs> lot of stuff coming through in the last day. Um, but uh, it's, it's going to be a situation where Penn State's going to approach it the same way they did last year. They're going to have guys that you know they have – maybe targeted as potential rumored guys that are going to go in there that they've done evaluations on. There's going to be guys that, that catch them off guard that they're going to have to do evaluations on. But the evaluation is the important thing, whether it's a guy that they've known in the past that they recruited as a high school player or something like that, or, you know, you're finding a guy like an Ebikiti, like a, a Derek Tangelo, who maybe your, your first evaluation was a, was fine, but they're a different player three or four years into their college career. And the other thing is, is don't get too anxious about, about guys that are going to the portal right now. If guys are going to the portal right now, most of the time they're either not starters, guys that got beat out, guys that are just looking for a, a change of scenery. Um, you know, I think a, a lot more value will come on later in December when these, uh, when these conversations start happening with guys that can improve their draft stock rather than improve, you know, their standing on, on a depth chart. Last December, we saw Penn State work swiftly. I think it was four days after the season finale, they landed a commitment from John Lovett, who was leaving Baylor at running back. Uh, by the time they got to January enrollment, they had four transfers on the roster, added another two scholarship transfers later in the year. Um, so we'll see you know, what the kind of splash they make this time around, Sean. I think clearly they should have some incentive after how things worked out for them with several of these players in, in, in 2020, uh, 2021. And you wonder what happens if you whiff on some of those transfer, more of those transfer misses and, and you don't really get an Epicade or you don't end up with a Tangelo, what kind of problems stem from that? You don't have to worry about it, but I think there, there's some cautionary tales in, in, the, in the transfer portal market, but there's also success stories and Penn State really now has a true genuine taste of those success stories that they didn't really have from the transfer portal era. And I do wonder if that's going to spur them on to continue really prioritizing this aspect of personnel building in college football here in 2021 into 2022. Yeah, no, I agree. They, they've got a selling point now, especially with Evakiti, who is a finalist for, and I just blanked on this, was it the Hendricks Award? The Hendricks Award. Award. Yeah, Hendricks top Award. defensive end. Um, that's a heck of a, I mean, for, for a defensive guy to transfer in one year and be a finalist for a national award or final watch list for the award um, is pretty amazing. And you can certainly sell that. Just a, uh, I did a quick look, a look up here. Ebikiti went into the portal on December 23rd and he committed to Penn State, I think, on the 31st or the 29th. Or, um, it was a couple, it was, it was less than a week later. Derek Tangelo went in on Christmas. So, I mean, these, these are guys that came in a little bit later in the process. So, find the right guys, get the right evaluations, um, you know, and, and, and figure out what you have to work with in scholarships. And I think that'll come later in December. So, patience, a very, very important thing in the portal. And let's also remember, 
uh, last year. The season didn't end until like December 19th. So the the whole like schedule was all thrown off. Uh, right now, you should have a, a, a better understanding of things really as you get into the signing day, which is helpful for a lot of staffs out there. Um, Sean, one other thing um, as we kind of look at the seniors here, because it feels like half the roster is freshmen, whether they're third year freshmen, second year freshmen, or first year freshmen. And then the other half feels like they're seniors, whether they're fourth or fifth or even sixth year. Right now, um, you've got to figure things out. I think the freshmen, that's going to be some attrition, all those different guys with a bunch of eligibility. I look to next spring. The writing is going to be on the wall for a lot of these players when they get back on the practice field. I think you look toward the end of next spring semester as another departure exit door moment for the portal. But right now, it's a lot about those seniors. And it's, you know, the, the one guy that we keep going to and hammering here is Sean Clifford. Um, you know, does he come back for the 2022 season? We don't know. But after the game on Saturday, um, you know, we didn't have this kind of content in front of us yet uh, in the postgame podcast on Saturday night. But Sean looked back at, at this season as a whole, and I have a story up on Lions 24-7 uh, from Monday night on it. Says he felt like he significantly improved, but then he looks at the win-loss total and, and, and you know, just you can hear it in his voice um, just a lot of disappointment. He used the phrase bummer to describe how the season turned out. Um, and I do really wonder because not only, you know, some people might view this as a boost if he were to come back, but boy, it sure could be a wrench in the plans in some different ways as you're bringing in a couple quarterbacks. Are you surveying the transfer portal market at quarterback? What does Mike Yersuch want? What does the staff feel like they can still maximize from Sean Clifford? Has he hit a ceiling? There is so much to this conversation and whatever the decision is, I think you're going to have a tremendously emotional outpouring from the fan base. And we're going to have to find out soon. Sean said he wants to wait till after the season, after the season. That's been the mantra for a long time. Now there's one game left. It's going to be his 33rd start in a Penn state uniform, but we still don't know if it's going to be the farewell tour. Yeah. And I think that if you look at, if you look at his career and you look at what he can provide, I think you make arguments on both sides, uh, you know, as, as a little bit stronger during the season, just based on what we um, had seen or had not seen from the guys behind him, but Veyu coming out and, and, and playing well, I think it does. It doesn't change things, but it gives you a little bit more data to work with, a little bit more perspective to work with. Penn State is going to look in the transfer portal. They already had have started looking at quarterbacks in the transfer portal, um, but I think that's more standard operating procedure than anything. You don't want to be missing on anything. I don't think they're going to land a Spencer Rattler or anything like that, but I mean, you you certainly want to put yourself in position to maybe find out if there's uh, surprising interest from somebody or you know find somebody. I, I hate to compare him to. Uh, a defensive tackle, but Derek Tangelo always wanted to play at Penn State. I mean, you know, that's maybe something you didn't know before he went to the portal. So I think that's a, a very interesting way to look at it. Um, and you've got to you've got to figure out what the balance is. You got Veyu coming back. Um, you know, Roberson might be a guy that sticks around and gets his degree. And um, you got the two freshmen that are slated to come in in January. So I, I don't know what the the correct call is. Um, you mentioned some other guys there. Um, Lucetta, I, I think will will eventually go pro, but I think Jair Brown will be back. Um, we, we saw that he was not introduced with the seniors. Another one that's interesting to me, that's probably not interesting to anybody else, but Chris Stoll was also in that group, was not introduced with the seniors. So I wouldn't be surprised to see him back. Um, so they've got some decisions to make some conver more conversations to have than decisions to make because those guys have been around for a long time have, have some of them have played a lot of football others uh, might find themselves in a situation where they're done um you know kind of in a in a situation like Shane Simmons last year where they think they're done with football and all of a sudden hey I've got one more year and I'm I'm not going to the pros so maybe that's something to think about there as well and the most difficult conversations will be guys who are convinced they're not done with football and convinced they can make it work at Penn State and they can fulfill the goals they set out four years ago, five years ago. And then how does Franklin, how does the staff counter that if they maybe disagree with the sentiment? That's the really tough dialogue that has to happen here. That's tough dialogue. But it also, you, you haven't had a situation like this before where you're going to have guys that want to come in and leave and typically in those situations in past years you would try and talk them into staying now with the way that the portal works with the way that you can find a guy that you know maybe could come in and, and be on the same level or maybe potentially have a little bit more upside you don't really have to have those conversations if they want to go they can go and they, if they don't want to be here they, they you know it sounds harsh saying it like that but that's kind of the situation with college football right now and and because you can play right away and you can go right away and um, make an impact somewhere else. And I, I just don't think that they'll be sweating those decisions as much as they have in the past. And I did want to say one other thing. I, I talked about not really going after guys in the portal right now, but some of those spots that have had coaching changes like Oklahoma, 
I mean, that's that's possibly a time that you could strike. So the the more Abikiti, the smaller guys, the smaller school level guys going up is probably later in December. But now if you have an opportunity to grab a kid at Oklahoma that you maybe had a prior relationship with and wants to get closer to home or something like that, um, that that's a good time to make that work. Sean Clifford, by the way, 21 and 11 in his 32 starts with Penn State. He started off 8 0 as the starter with the Nittany Lions. Um, now in his career, 71 total touchdowns, 22 interceptions this year. Highest completion percentage of his career at 62.4. Highest passing yardage total of 2,912 in his three seasons as a starter. And his six interceptions, Sean, are the lowest despite him throwing nearly 90 fewer passes than his previous career high. Some good stuff there, but. The wins and losses add up, and I feel like a lot of people who cover this team, who follow this team, and I'm curious on the coaching staff, maybe assume or acknowledge that you've squeezed as much as you can out of Sean Clifford as your quarterback, as your offensive trigger man. Now it's time to take a look elsewhere. Fiercely loyal, James Franklin, though. That's, I think, the, the thing people are worried about. If, if Sean Clifford does stick around, how long is his leash, and does he deserve that long of a leash? And that's a conversation we can table until we have to get there. But well, people God. are very wary <laughs> of that subject, as you know. So we'll we'll keep tabs on, on what happens with Clifford and all these seniors. There is so much personnel movement to come. And it, it's a great reason to jump on board at Lions247.com, by the way, because not only do we have you covered here, but our amazing team of national analysts have the transfer portal on lockdown, have the recruiting market on lockdown. So these next few weeks, the coaching staff search, we can tap into a lot of different resources in the 24-7 sports market. It's all behind uh, our VIP wall usually with this kind of stuff. So check that out at lines247.com. Join us if you have not already. It's time for our mailbag, Sean, and uh, we're going to jump right back over to that conversation about James Franklin and how this contract was handled. Here it is. Do you think that a public and emphatic statement from James Franklin during that rough patch of games affirming his commitment to the program would have changed the course of this Penn State season? I don't think it would have changed it much, to be honest with you. I mean, you look at the Illinois game, and that's really what you're going to keep coming back to when you think of this season because, um, you know, some of those other losses, I don't want to say they're understandable, but some pretty, you know, tough teams in there, um, you know, teams that will end up in the top 15. Um, but, yeah, I think I, I think it probably could have, um, you know, kept – some of the distraction off the players. I, I, I'm not a big, you know, the the everything that's going on is going to impact everything else type thing. Um, but you, you, you did look um, out of sorts. You did look out of focus for that Illinois game. So I, I think maybe it changes a little bit. I don't think it would have put Penn State uh, in the playoff. I don't think it would have put Penn State uh, at the top of the Big Ten with a chance to go to the Rose Bowl or anything like that. But I, I do think that maybe a little bit more focus in the middle of the season was something they could have used. So yeah, I, I'll say a, a, so, a very soft yes. Yeah, I think it's human nature that there was some impact uh, across the locker room. To me, the bigger issue against Illinois is that you had, what, a 50% Sean Clifford trying to play quarterback for you and lead your offense without a run game. That, to me, is a bigger issue. Some of the injuries that popped up are bigger issues. Uh, the inability to establish your offensive line uh, on the ground from game one through game 12 was a bigger issue. I don't think you can really build in or slip in any kind of Franklin related excuses to those particular things. But when you're talking about a team that lost what five games by 21 total points and you're finding these small margins for error, did it tip the scales in some way conceivably over the course of a practice week? If you're hearing about your coach taking another job and whether you're paying attention or not, he's showing up to the post-practice media session and not saying he's going to be the quarter, not saying he's going to be the coach in 2022. And he had his reasons for that, but it's a calculated gamble. It's a calculated risk when you're the head coach and, and you don't go public like that. You'd like to think that your conversations internally will carry a lot of water, but there's still going to be, I think, human nature that's going to creep in for these 18 to 23 year olds. They're talking to their parents. They're talking to their friends. And if you were watching Sports Center or paying attention to college football for a significant stretch of this season, you were wondering if James Franklin was sticking around. So yeah, th th that there's is so much information. Yeah, there's so much information available to anybody and everybody yeah. right now that that you it would take more effort to avoid it than it would be just to deal with it and, and head on. So I, I think that what we're having here is is the conversation of hindsight and that, that you lost yep. a game that you have no business losing. I mean, you you can argue uh, Ohio State and obviously Iowa with the injury and things like that, and Michigan's a really good football team, obviously a. Pro 
probably better than than and we gave them credit for after that that Penn State win that Penn State had a chance to beat them uh and then in Michigan State I mean you it just uh didn't didn't go your way so but but that Illinois one just sticks out like a sore thumb and when you have a loss like that it's very very easy to to, to second guess a lot of things that that went on Brandon Short on this podcast called the seven and five finish unacceptable he also full-throatedly supported uh, getting James Franklin on board long term so Interesting place right now for Penn State football. We'll cover it along the way. It's going to be a very, very key offseason, but we're not quite there yet. We still have a bowl game. We're going to learn about that next week. We plan on bringing some recruits here on the show, give you some future Nittany Lions to, uh, and hearing from them and, and what they plan for their future. A lot of these guys are going to be on campus in six weeks or so, all of a sudden as freshmen. So stay with us here on the podcast. Go over to lions247.com for the latest on the parent defensive coordinator search uh, and also the latest with recruiting transfer portal uh, staff stuff. There's, there's just so much going on right now uh, for Sean, for Lance. And thanks again to Brandon short for his time. I'm Tyler Donahue. This is the lions 24 seven podcast.